Friends, in our last session, we had a discussion with the Imam of our local mosque here in South Bend, Imam Muhammad Sirajuddin, about Islamic traditions regarding the revelation of the Quran from God to the angel Gabriel and from the angel Gabriel to Muhammad. In the course of that discussion, we saw a number of, or we heard a number of elucidations of traditional perspectives on how that process of revelation worked. And in some ways, we saw how those traditional perspectives or traditional doctrines were built in a way that we might call apologetic, that are meant to defend the traditional Islamic belief that the Quran is a heavenly book on earth. We saw, for example, the notion that Muhammad was illiterate. This was important because, as the Imam shared with us, this is a way of saying that he couldn't have been influenced by earthly things. He couldn't have been reading books and getting religious ideas from his books. He received everything from God through the angel. We saw also this notion that immediately after the Prophet received a revelation from the angel Gabriel, he had it written down. This seems to be a way of saying that there was no corruption that could have taken place um, in that period. We also saw this traditional notion of how the angel Gabriel reviewed with Muhammad the correct order of the surahs of the Quran. That is, not only did the angel Gabriel give the message of the Quran to Muhammad, but he also told him how to put that message together. And that is a way of making the claim that the book as it now stands with its 114 surahs, which go from Surah Al-Fatiha, number one, to Surah An-Nas, number 114, that that precise order is willed by God. In this lecture, we're going to look at some of the same questions, but from an academic perspective not from the perspective necessarily of, of Muslim belief, but from th those of scholars who, in a historical sense, seek to understand the development of the Qur'an as a text. We might begin by pointing out that a lot of scholars doubt certain of the traditional assertions that Muslims make. For example, they doubt that Muhammad was illiterate. Now, according to the traditional biography of the Prophet Muhammad, he was a merchant, and he would have therefore been involved in dealing with, presumably, typical things for a merchant that have to do with transactions, and then would have needed to have some sort of ability to read and write. Of course, they wouldn't follow the idea that the angel Gabriel met with Muhammad, this sort of supernatural idea, to review every year the order of the surahs. Academic scholars note, and something we've already uh, mentioned in our discussions together, that the order of the Quran seems to have been put together with another vision in mind, We've seen that the surahs of the Qur'an generally proceed from longest to shortest, and we've seen that that general principle of ordering is interrupted by little packets of surahs that seem to be put together because of those letters, which we've called the mysterious letters, that appear at the beginning of certain surahs. But there's something we didn't cover in detail in our earlier discussions, and we didn't cover in detail in our conversation with the Imam. That is, how the Qur'an went from scraps or pieces of revelation written down on individual pieces of parchment or other materials to a book that was put together and distributed and read widely by Muslims. And that's what we'll get into together today. In order to speak about this, we'll be speaking first about traditional Islamic ideas of what we can call the collection and the codification of the Qur'an. These two words are used generally when we're speaking about the formation of the Quranic text. The collection is a reference to the way that different pieces of material were brought together. And the codification is a reference to the way they were all bound together in one book and eventually distributed for public consumption. Now, Muslim scholars tell two different stories about the collection and codification of the Quran. According to the first story, the first step in the process by which the Qur'an went from individual revelations to a book took place during the reign of the first caliph or political successor of the Prophet Muhammad, whose name was Abu Bakr. Tradition tells us that Abu Bakr reigned as caliph between the year 632, that is, immediately after the death of Muhammad, to the year 634. And the story proceeds that during those years of his caliphate, there were certain rebellions, or rather apostasies, against the rule of Abu Bakr in Medina. Now, some of these cases were Arab tribes who rejected Islam entirely, but more common were Arab tribes who remained within Islam, but refused to pay taxes to Abu Bakr, who didn't recognize his authority. They recognized only the authority of the Prophet Muhammad. And it's said that battles, the battles that took place when Abu Bakr went to suppress 
and in fact to crush these apostasies or rebellions, that in those battles, especially one battle known as the Battle of Yamama, many men who had memorized the Quran died. And it's said that when this happened, some of the followers went to Abu Bakr, and in particular, one follower named Omar, who would become the second caliph, and told Abu Bakr, now is the time to put the Quran together in one book, because if we don't, we'll lose some of it, since those who had memorized the Quran have died in this battle. Abu Bakr, it said, initially resisted and said, but the Prophet Muhammad never put the Quran together in one book. He had scraps of it written down here and there, but he never put it in a book, so I won't do this. But Omar pushed and pressed and insisted that it must be done, and eventually Abu Bakr relented and had the book written down. It said that he called on a scribe who used to write the Quran down in the days of the Prophet Muhammad named Zayd ibn Thabit, who was from the city of Medina, not from Mecca, and another committee of some Meccans, and they had the, the Quran written down, one copy of it only in loose leaves. These leaves, when um, Abu Bakr died, passed on to the second caliph, Omar. And then when Omar died, they were passed on to Omar's daughter, Hafsa. And it said even that she kept these leaves under her bed. Now, there's a second story or a second part of this longer story about how the Quran was collected and codified. According to this story, when the third caliph, so we had Abu Bakr and then Omar, and then the third caliph, Uthman, when he became the caliph of the Islamic Empire in the year 644, during his reign, it said that Muslim soldiers at one point while they were on military campaigns to expand Islam somewhere way up to the north near Armenia or Azerbaijan, soldiers from Syria and Iraq begin to fight or dispute over the proper reading of the Quran. And it said indeed that one of the generals of these military campaigns named Hudayfa traveled all the way to Medina to visit with the caliph and to tell him, in fact, the quotation goes something like this, I'm paraphrasing here, O oh, commander of the believers, put, a, put together for us one Quran, one book, and distribute it so that we may not be divided as Jews and Christians are divided over their book. Uthman then, provoked by this possibility that divisions might continue, is said to have gathered up those sheets, remember those leaves of the Quran that were originally composed under the command of Abu Bakr, but had been left under the bed of Omar's daughter Hafsa. It said that Uthman gathered these up and then convened a new committee, much like Abu Bakr had once done, again led by Zayd ibn Thabit, the former scribe of the Prophet himself, and a number of Meccans. He had the Quran written down again in one book, but this time he had that book bound. He had copies made. He sent those copies out to different important cities of the early nascent Islamic empire, and he commanded that all variant copies. Here it's important to point out that according to the logic of this story, other companions of the Prophet had already made their own personal copies of the Quran, which we can call companion codices. The Codex is a book that's been bound together like a book as we know it. These companion codices were ordered to be destroyed by the Caliph Uthman. And according to the logic of this account, the, the whole story ends here. The problem was solved. The official version of the Quran, written down by scribes under the order of Uthman, was distributed to these important cities around the empire, and no other version survived because the rest were all destroyed. Now, academic scholars have some problems with this story. They point out a number of issues which seem to make it maybe questionable in terms of its veracity. It's said on the one hand that, for example, Abu Bakr didn't want to go ahead and have the Quran written down because the Prophet Muhammad himself never did this. And yet on the other hand, we hear that Zayd ibn Thabit was chosen to lead this commission in both cases for Abu Bakr and Uthman because he used to write down the Quran in the Prophet's day. Other scholars have investigated the story about the number of people who had memorized the Quran dying in the battle of Yamama and found out that, in fact, very few had died in this battle, very few men who had memorized the Quran. Other scholars have pointed out that these two stories seem to duplicate each other. Abu Bakr gets a commission together, led by Zayd ibn Thabit, and Uthman later does the same thing. Another problem that scholars have with this story is the bit about the soldiers from Syria and Iraq fighting over the correct pronunciation of the Quran. In fact, 
the text that would have been written down by Uthman or under the orders of Uthman would have provided only the consonants. Early Arabic manuscripts are written only with consonants, not with vowels. This is a particular feature of Semitic languages where vowels can be omitted because people are able to infer from the consonantal text how to read them. So this consonantal text would have acted in a way to give only basic information about the reading of the text, but not its pronunciation. You need vowels for pronunciation. Therefore, it would not have solved the dispute that took place between this, the, the apparent dispute, according to the tradition, between soldiers from Iraq and Syria. There are other points to be made. There are, very, there, there are a large number of variants of this story. Other, other versions of the story have not Abu Bakr, but the second caliph, Omar, being the first one to have the Quran collected. Others give a role to Ali, who's the fourth caliph. And one scholar, seemingly exasperated by all the variants, says, God inspired or guided all four of these caliphs, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and Ali, in order to write down the Quran, or rather to collect it and codify it. In order to finish this story, we, we can add an academic perspective by looking a bit at traditions regarding variants and traditions or the evidence we have today from actual manuscripts of the Quran. Here's the first point to be made in this perspective. We do have among Quranic manuscripts a relatively stable consonantal text, a basic text of the Quran, which is basically the same in different manuscripts and it seems to be a pretty ancient text. Now, it's true that Islamic tradition says that there were other manuscripts that once existed before Uthman's official version was distributed. And when we read medieval literature, we see various accounts of what these manuscripts looked like. And I'll give just two examples. For example, Quran chapter 11, verse 71, tells the story of Abraham and his wife. And it says of his wife, his wife was standing by, so she laughed. This is an interesting passage connected to Genesis 18. It said that in the manuscript of one of the companions that was eventually destroyed, named Ibn Mas'ud, it added a sentence here. Whereas the version of Uthman says his wife was standing by, the version of this fellow Ibn Mas'ud was his wife was standing by and he was sitting. So apparently in his version, God revealed not only what position his wife, Abraham's wife, that is Sarah, was in, but also the position that Abraham was in. By the way, I didn't mention, but it's interesting to know that this fellow, Ibn Mas'ud, is said to have been the one who resisted the most when the Caliph Uthman gave the order that his version of the Quran had to be destroyed. It, he, he insisted that his version was more authentic, and it's even said that it got in a physical confrontation with the soldiers of, of Uthman who had been sent to have his copy of, or his version of the Quran destroyed. Another interesting variant that's said to have existed in these manuscripts takes place in regard to Quran chapter 7, verse 26. There we have a story about Adam, and it's said that feathers were sent down to the children of Adam. This has always caused trouble. What does it mean? Feathers were sent down. The Arabic word is rish. The, the verse says, we have provided you with clothing to cover your bodies and feathers. It said that in the version of the Quran or the codex of another companion who was in Damascus named Ubay, we had not the word, we had not the word rish for feathers, but the word zina, which means uh, instead adornment. So here, according to his version, the Quran would have said, we've sent down to you not feathers, but adornment. Now, the problem with these traditions is that we don't have a single manuscript that came from Ibn Mas'ud or Ubay or any other companion. The only manuscript we have is one stable text. And Muslim tradition would say, oh, that's the text of Uthman. It's not 100% stable. We'll get into that a little bit. There are some variants to this, um, this one form of the Quranic text. Well, there's another sort of variant which is more interesting. Friends, I've mentioned that the Quran that was recorded in its earlier manuscripts only is recorded in a consonantal skeleton, only the consonants. And because of this, when medieval Muslim scholars were trying to read this manuscript, they came up with different interpretations or different possible readings, the Arabic term is qira'at, different possible readings of this consonantal text. I'll give just some examples of this. In Surat al-Fatiha, one common reading and the one we find in the official Quran today is a phrase, maliki yawm which means possessor of the day of judgment, 
But we have another possible reading that's recorded by medieval Islamic texts, which is, you know, the best way to read this consonantal text here is Maliki Yomadin, which means not possessor of the Day of Judgment, but king of the Day of Judgment. Similar is Quran chapter 2, verse 102, where the Quran, according to one way of reading this consonantal text, says Malakain, two angels. But according to another way of reading the text, it's Malikain, so the a vowel has been changed to an i, and there, thereby the reading would say two kings, not two angels. More interesting, perhaps, is Quran chapter 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 88. Again, the same phrase is found in chapter 4, verse 155, where the Quran, according to the standard reading, says, Kulu bana gulfun, our hearts are uncircumcised or closed. In our translation, we have our minds are closed, but really what the text says is our hearts are uncircumcised. But another variant reading of this same consonantal text with different vowels says, Kulu bana gulufun, which means not that our hearts are closed, but our hearts are containers. And there are different stories that are meant to explain the two different versions of the way of reading this. These are different variants from the ones attributed to companions of the Prophet. We can call these canonical variants because they're all based on the same consonantal text. And they tell us that Muslims disputed the proper way of reading the text. Now eventually, a sort of reconciliation or resolution of these disputes took place when Muslim scholars, led by a certain Ibn Mujahid, came to the conclusion that there are seven proper ways of reading the text, and indeed that God revealed the text in seven different manners or seven different readings. I might point out that the final resolution to this problem of reading the consonantal text took place in the year 1924 in the city of Cairo in Egypt, and we'll conclude with this point. Today, if you read the Qur'an, if you look at an Arabic text of the Qur'an, even with different printings, even on various websites if you read the text online, the Arabic will look the same. But it wasn't always that way. The reason why the Arabic text looks the same is because of the set success of one particular edition of the Qur'an produced in the city of Cairo by the Egyptian Ministry of Education in 1924. The Ministry of Education, because it was frustrated with differences between variant printings of the Quran that were being imported for use in schools in Egypt, the Ministry of Education determined that it would be best to produce their own official text of the Quran. And they gathered a committee like this, rather they gathered a committee to accomplish this, something which sort of reminds us of the committees of Abu Bakr and Uthman, and they established one text according to one reading known as Hafs an Asim, and it's said that they took all of the variant printings that they had used or brought in and imported to Egypt for use in schools, and they had them gathered up and sunk in the Nile River outside of Cairo or in the midst of Cairo in Egypt. Again, the story reminds us of the way that Uthman had variant versions of the codex he established or rather, he had the codices that other companions claimed were more accurate destroyed so that only his would be the one used in the Islamic Empire. We see that from an academic perspective, we have a number of questions about the history of the collection and codification of the Quranic text. The biggest question today for academic scholars of the Quran is, can we establish what we call a critical edition? Can we use manuscripts to establish an ancient form of the text that in fact would be more accurate, more ancient, more authentic than the version of the text established in 1924 in Cairo by the Ministry of Education. There is a project today in the city of Berlin, Germany, which is meant to do just that. And they're using a number of manuscripts to compare and contrast to come up with a more authoritative text and also to note variants. And one of the interesting parts of this project is certain manuscripts which we call palimpsests, which seem to have a layer of Quran that was erased and a new layer written on top of it. And when we look at this lower layer that was once erased, we find interesting variants even to the consonantal text. Therefore, there's a lot of work to be done, and it's still to be seen what will happen with this project for a critical edition. But for academic scholars, this is an important question and a promising project for the establishment of an ancient Quranic text.